1994, Ray Anderson set a goal for his company. By the year 2020, Interface will take nothing from the earth that is not rapidly and readily renewable. What you're going to learn on the tour today is how we're going about achieving that goal. I think the story of Interface begins about 1965 and 1966 when I was working at Callaway Mills Company before it was acquired by Milliken. And I was passed over for promotion to the one job in the company I really wanted, running one of the divisions of Callaway. And from that moment I began to set my sights on doing my own thing. I just didn't want someone else to have that much control over my destiny. But it took a long time to find that one thing, just the exact right idea. I saw that first carpet tile at Carpets International in 1969. I fell in love with that idea. It just made so much sense, so right, so smart. I began to correspond with Carpets International about bringing their technology to the United States. Carpets International was prepared to invest their 750000 in this new venture. And I left Milliken on February the 12th, 1973. I am sitting at my desk at the last hour of my tenure with Milliken, and two Milliken people walk in the room and say, we don't think you can do this. To which I replied, the hell you say? And all of the pieces began to fall into place. On April the 6th, 1973, we had Interface fully capitalized. And then the business just took off. It doubled and tripled every year you know, for the next 10. And we very quickly became um, the dominant carpet tile manufacturer in America. In 1994, all of that's in hand. It's working, the business is booming. And, uh, and I'm 60 years old. Now, what does one do in that situation? You know, where does, where does one's thoughts turn? Is it to retirement and, you know, the seashore of the mountains, chasing a little white ball? None of that suited me. And we've begun to hear this question from customers that we'd never heard before. Uh, in so many words, what's your company doing for the environment? For which we had no answers. And it was, uh, it was very embarrassing. It was, it was awkward for our salespeople. It was awkward for us, our manufacturing people, our research people, uh, because we just could, didn't have anything we could say. So a group in our research di division decided we ought to convene a task force and bring people from around the world to come together to, to assess our company's environmental position. What were we doing? Let's get us a list of things that we're doing. So they, uh, they came to me and they said, yeah, let's, 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 we want to do this. I said, great, you know, go for it. And they said, well, we want you to launch this task force to meet with them in their first meeting and launch them, give them a kickoff speech with your environmental vision. I didn't have an environmental vision. I didn't want to make that speech. They stayed on my case, and I finally said, okay, I'll be with you, I'll meet with you, and I'll, make, I'll launch your task force. But I did not know what I was going to say. I, I, I was really sweating. And at that moment, Paul Hawkins' book landed on my desk, and you know, the, sort of like the rest is history. I was not an environmentalist. I, hadn't given, I had never given a thought to what we were taking from the earth or doing to the earth to make our products, except to be, always be sure there's enough of that stuff coming through the pipeline to keep our factories running, uh, but not a thought. I was, but I was uh, attuned to my customers, and when I, when I found a subject that they were interested in, I got interested, but when I found Hawkins' book, it was uh, a spear in the chest experience, and I, I read it and wept because it just laid out you know, so clearly the, the problems of the industrial system, the system of which you know, my company, my creation, this third child of mine was an integral part. And I made that speech to that tiny little task force and 
using Hawkins material and uh, challenge them to lead our company to sustainability. I know personally that I continue to speak, not just that first speech of that little group, but gathering of interface people, plant meetings, sales meetings, and I liken it to a pebble dropped in a pond. You know, there's a ripple that goes from that that eventually dies on a, on a distant shore. But the continual speaking that I did continued to pour energy into the ripple so that the ripple grew instead of, instead of uh, diminishing. So from my point of view, that was my role, you know, to continue to articulate the vision over and over and over, even when people thought I'd gone round the bend. It was in that phase when I was talking and not knowing whether I was connecting. People were looking at me with blank faces, and I didn't know whether they heard me or cared or, you know. And then Glenn Thomas wrote that poem after being in one of those meetings, and it was just the most amazing, encouraging moment for me because he told me, by golly, one person got it, and, and I was, you know, I felt sure he must surely be speaking for more than himself. Tomorrow's child. Tomorrow's child without a name and unseen face and knowing not your time or place. Tomorrow's child, though, yet unborn. I met you first last Tuesday morning. A wise friend introduced us to, and through his sobering point of view, I saw a day that you would see, a day for you, but not for me. Knowing you has changed my thinking, for I never had an inkling that perhaps the things I do might someday somehow threaten you. Tomorrow's child, my daughter, son, I'm afraid I've just begun to think of you and of your good, though always having known I should. Begin, I will, to weigh the cost of what I squander, what is lost, if ever I forget that you will someday come and live here too. Get up and get going. There's lots to do. Step by step, we moved, we began to get traction and move up that mountain, that very high mountain, from the very beginning, you know, the metaphor of the mountain higher than Everest. And our people, one by one, made up their own minds, not something that anybody dictated, thou shalt do this. People adopted it on their own, and, you know, and the goodwill in the marketplace is just astounding. Those same people that were asking that question 11, 12 years ago, what's your company doing, have embraced the company for what we are doing. We're changing minds and changing hearts, and, and we are changing the culture of, of a company, and we're changing the culture of an industry, and in time, we might even change the culture of a culture. But it's turning out to be a better way, a better way to make a bigger profit. Uh, the, the amazing thing is, here we are 11 years into this journey, and our cost are down, not up. Our products are the best they've ever been, through David Oakey's uh, adoption of biomimicry. Our people are motivated, uh, but every, you know, I, I suppose when people see it, they finally, they get it and they can never unget it. Like somebody said, there's no such thing as an ex-environmentalist. When I saw carpet tiles the first time, you know, I thought, so smart, so right. When I saw sustainability and finally saw it with, with Hawkins' help, it was much, very much the same feeling, so right, so smart, but orders of magnitude more important. And today I would say that pioneering this new way of doing business is the ultimate purpose of Interface. It goes beyond the bottom line to a, a purpose, a higher purpose that all of us can subscribe to, be part of, be motivated by, and, and be be challenged by.